Ladies and gentlemen, here we are again, another session, and I'd like to thank Stan and uh, Olivier for the earlier one. <coughs> Sorry, excuse me, we're here at 10.30, and it's um, the time for safety and security in the new logistics environment. I've got three good guests here with me, and I'd like to introduce them now, and they are as follows. So firstly, we've got Kester Meyer, who's the Director of Operational Integrity, Compliance and Safety with KLM. Kester, lovely to have you on board again, my friend. And I think the last time we spoke, what a fantastic title. Thank you, Chris. It's uh, wonderful to be here. And uh, yeah. so looking forward to the session. Good man, good man. And then we've got Sonny Segal, who's Director at Transprotect Computers PLC. Nice to see you again, Sonny. Pleasure, thank you. Nice to have you on board here and looking forward to the session. Good, good, good. And last but by no means least, we've got Matthew Vaughan, who's Director of Aviation Security and Cyber Operations Safety and Security with IATA. Another good title there, Matthew. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Chris. Look forward to the chat also. Yeah, and it's lovely to see you, mate, after all these years. Right, now, here we are, Cargo Handling Logistics Digital Event, and we've got a great title, Safety and Security in the New Logistics Environment. And when we're talking about the new, I mean, obviously, it's not, it's not that much uh, dissimilar to what it was before we were all overtaken by this damn pandemic but it's brought so many more things to light and people are a lot more risk risk aware they're a lot more focused on worst case scenarios and there i say they're a lot more hardened now to some of the surprises and shocks that will probably be coming our way in the next few years so firstly i'd like to start with you kester please if i may from a carrier's perspective and especially with regard to to safety, but then also how security sometimes crosses over into the into the boundaries of safety. What have been the major changes that you guys have focused on um, over the last few months? I think the biggest change was the, the, the change in workforce size, the change in experience, but then uh, when cargo picked up again after the beginning of the COVID, bringing new people into cargo. So it's, it's been a very interesting mix of uh, a lot of experience and some new guys on the block. So um, we stopped uh, with some temporary staff, but we have them back now. Um, looking at incidents, for instance, I don't. We haven't seen a, a huge pickup, but we have seen that some of the traditional routes were no longer available. So many more requests uh, for kind of cargo that we haven't seen before, um, or substances that in the old days we would not really want to carry and and especially when you talk about the combination of security and uncontrolled substances i think that even the bad guys had a problem in terms of uh, transporting their goods their wares and so um, we've had some challenges there to make absolutely sure that uh, the uncontrolled stuff doesn't come on board of our aircraft and, and make sure that our staff on the ground uh, also remain safe and are not pressurized into doing things that uh, we don't want them to do. It's, it's been an amazing journey in learning uh, as uh, maybe uh, types of dry ice limits, uh, cargo in cabin, what you have. So um, it has never been such an intense time uh, as I've ever experienced in the past uh, 30 years. Yeah, no, I can, I, I can, I can believe that, Kester. And we'll come back to those issues of, of um, you know, cargo in the cabin and dry ice and, and battery loggers, et cetera. But now just quickly, and a question to both, both Sonny and, and to Matthew. Now, everything, everything has got, seemed, it seems to have got faster, quicker. And this last, this last pandemic period has probably packed in more and more change and more, more responses than, than in the last 10 years, especially when it comes to digitization, digital transformation, and, and basically the focus on data. Now, with that in mind, I mean, it must be a minefield, guys, out there without, you know, without trying to panic anybody, but people need to be aware. So, Sonny and, and Matthew, from your understanding of how things have gone over the last, say, year or so, have you seen a marked increase or a, an uptake in activity on the, shall we say, the, the shadier sides of, of uh, what you specialise in? So I can start, if you like. Um, 
Absolutely. Um, I mean, there's been a massive increase in the, the amount of cyber activity going on, the attacks going on in organisations. Um, we've seen it all in the press, of course, over the last year or so. But I think the most important thing is the complexity and the tenacity of the, the people who are the threat actors and the way they get into systems is just mind boggling. And they're using all sorts of techniques and techniques that we would not even have imagined that are possible, which is really crazy. And um, it's, it's, it's a constant fight. I'm sure Matthew will also concur with that. It's a constant fight to keep up with these guys. And, and you know, regardless of all the, the security measures that you put in place, there's always some methodology that someone's rigging into. And we probably see that with the number of updates that are coming through from Microsoft, from Apple, you know, all these updates that are coming through from your endpoints. Or, or they're there for a reason, is because there's some security breaches that have been discovered and uh, they want you to protect yourself against getting attacked. So it's, yeah. it's, in summary, it's very, very complex, Chris, and it's getting uh, the accelerated pace is just humongous at the moment. Yeah, and, and then, and Matthew, from obviously from your official capacity, mm. will I answer? Yeah, look, I, I fully agree with what, what Sonny is saying. The the attack surface, which is kind of the, the traditional cyber vernacular, uh, certainly has increased a lot, lot more connected to, um, you know, a lot, lot more things online. Uh, and the old the old adage that uh, it, it's not a matter of when, it's it's kind of a matter of knowing that you've been uh, breached and and kind of understanding what are the controls and and risk management practices that are required to, to get yourself out of that with as little little damage as possible. I, I actually think the the nexus between physical and digital security has has absolutely crossed over mm -hmm. in, in the sense that you know 10, 15 years ago it was bomb in the box, uh, which still remains in the, the top three of, of ICAO's annual security <laughs> risk assessment um, publication. Uh, but yeah, the, the emphasis on the digital uh, controls and and doing what you need to do to c continue to operate business, which is, you know, the opening comments that you spoke about, Chris, in in terms of just developing this culture of resilience and not not just risk management. Yeah, yeah. Okay, now um, just 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 on that, uh, Matthew, and just to go into that now. Obviously, on one hand. On one hand, you've got people worried about what's happening with their data. And then on the other hand, we've got the whole industry and everybody else encouraging people to start getting involved in big data, sharing data, collaboration, which, I mean, a lot of good good words. And, and you know, the, the title of this particular digital event is Bring Back Better and Make It Matter. Now, all, all any crisis should have some learning from it. But this particular one, it should have something exceptional coming out of this. So now when, when carriers and, and GHAs and everybody are given the opportunity to share data and to put more data out there, when you look at, I mean, even last week, there was another announcement with, you know, somebody from within our industry that looked like they were hacked and they were going to, you know, um, the, the, the perpetrators were going to show all the details and customer information, etc. I mean, it's no wonder that people are a little bit fearful and the old resistance was one of not wanting to give other people information and the competitive advantage but now you know it's, it's almost like a, a paradox a conundrum there as to whether or not you should really open your arms to data sharing and then you're opening up this 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 new world of of cyber security yeah you're spot on there there is a a, a confidence challenge here that that you know not just aviation is struggling with but a, a bunch of industries out there are, are are trying to look at it and create those trusted communities uh and, and you know ultimately that's what it comes down to it, it is that trust and in again using sort of traditional cyber terminology they talk about zero trust controls right which which yeah. essentially is not something that is is going to to have aviation uh, continue to operate at, at the speeds and the volumes that it does today, you you actually need trust between systems, people, locations, and you can see that un unfortunately, uh, COVID eroded away some of that. 
right? And and certainly on the on the passenger side of, of operations. But mm-hmm. uh, yeah, this in this um, emphasis to to maintain the the paper or the traditional paper uh, documentation, we see it in in terms of the the consignment security declaration for example right you know that is a a declaration that carriers need to be able to accept that trusted supply chain that it has been regulated um and you know it it's being utilized more than sort of the the electronic csd which which you know is is a matter of messaging and making sure those standards are are compatible yeah yeah nice Uh, many challenges i just coming across to you kester and um, like transferring now from the security side onto the safety side. Um, one of the things that, that I, I find amazing is if you go to any carrier or, or you know, you, you get involved in a bit of consultancy or whatever, people will say to you, well, tell me what the industry standards are, or the industry range or the industry recommendations. So when you're talking about SPIs or whatever, yeah, it's a very difficult thing to do because most people don't want anybody else to see what they are doing, what they're doing well or what they're struggling with. I mean, Kester, why, why, why do you think that's, that's something that that you know just just causes so many problems within our environment. I think because the reputation these days with social media is being enlarged, and so if you put something out there, it, it will quickly become a reputation thing. So you see it with live animals, for instance. If you make one mistake with one yeah. animal to the wrong place, and you have an influencer <laughs> on social media, oh man, you are in for it. Yeah. So I guess that's where it is. What I do like is the role of IATA in bringing together uh, the experts, subject matter experts. Uh, we have quite a few here at KLM, and they they really love going to those uh, meetups uh, and discuss with their peers what's happening on the uh, the safety side, uh, how we can improve. Uh, but I do think, uh, in terms of awareness, we should be sharing more. Uh, we should be sharing best practices more, and. Uh, in, in an earlier webcast we did together, Chris, I, I shared an example of uh, that we have some toolbox uh, applications um, made for our own staff, but we have made them available to the wider industry uh, on, in terms of uh, safety. But absolutely right. We need to grow there and share. And if you look especially into dangerous goods, there's another great initiative by IATA, which is the, the dangerous goods, the, the, the occurrence reporting. Yeah, yeah. I don't understand that that one doesn't take off because it ties right into the basic flight safety of an aircraft that is also carrying passengers and crew and and very valuable cargo. We should do much more with that. And so from my perspective, um, we are very open uh, in, in reporting and sharing also our bad experiences. That's where we learn from. That's where we need to come together uh, as I think it's it's most important that we are always focusing on only technology or organization concept of operations. End of the day, it is our people. They they are the ones who go like, hey, wait a minute. Um, I can see the shipment. It has been tendered to us as non-dangerous goods. Why do I see these uh, labels on the package, which clearly indicates lithium batteries? So yeah. that, you know, and then take action, do something with it. And I think there we, we can still as industry grow uh, and, and, and have more trust that uh, if I'm willing to learn, if I'm open to learning, I should also share my own bad experiences. Yeah, yeah. And, and also something we spoke about last time, Kester, was about the levels of competence and some of the tick box training and tick, tick box auditing that goes on just for the sake of administration. Yeah, I mean, right. surely, uh, you know, you're all seeing that, you know, senior C-suite, um, leaders now are looking differently now, you know, about risk and about being aware and worst case scenario. It's, it's got to be the way forward because people can't assume that everything is going to be according to a budget and then have to respond and react. It's far better to be aware of worst case scenarios and just adjust. Absolutely. And, and, I, and I think uh, tick the boxes is never a good thing because it, then it becomes routine and you tick the, the right boxes and then something goes horrendously wrong. And that's something nobody in the industry uh, wants wants to take place. And I think we should also be aware, coming back to the people side of it, that if you look at the shortage of staffing, both on the trucking, the road feeder service, but also on the the handling agents, GHAs, I think that the 
there's a lot of room for error now. It's increasing because people are cutting corners. There's too much work uh, for yep, too yep. few people. And so we are very aware that this can happen. Mm -hmm. And, and um, so it is also about building multiple barriers into your system. But also, I don't want to downplay the technology side because I think we should support our people with proper technology that based on the data that we do share, will identify a potential risk. So we should have green lanes where everything is cleared and can go through, but we should mm -hmm. also have like the yellow traffic light that, hey, wait a minute, something might be wrong. Let's take a look at it. Uh, I think that's that's the technology that needs to support our people. Yeah, yeah, no, I agree. I've just got, I've got a newspaper here and um, um, it was from, it was from uh, yesterday's paper. And um, one of the things that I just pulled out it was something that somebody wrote and they said about democratization of data. And the number one thing that I hear from the many CEOs and CIOs I talk to is that they don't feel ready for the democratization of data because they don't trust employees to make the right decisions using it. Now, Sonny, one of the things that I know we've spoken about before is you get legacy IT departments and you get legacy IT managers. And to be fair to them, they're doing what they, what they feel they're doing as best and they've got the best intentions at heart, but they're not up with the most, with the most modern or the most, you know, the most common threats or, or defenses. You know, and in, in lots of cases, even, you know, even multi-factor defenses aren't being used. And it's, it's, it's very, very, it's very raw. And you think to yourselves, my God, you know, an organization wouldn't wouldn't leave the back door open as wide if it was to do with commercial issues or operational issues or even safety issues, Kester. Mm. So what you know, why why do you think that is is continually being allowed to be one of the one of the big, big problems? I think you know, traditional IT managers have, have got a role to play and they're doing their job that they 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 were employed to do. But security is a very, very big field. And unfortunately, you know, it's not an easy thing to deal with. Um, it's complex and it is a really specialist field and some people can afford it some people cannot um, those people that can afford really you know high-end security teams still have the challenges you know uh, governments in the US employ the best people of course but they still get hacked um, and it's an ever-evolving chain and I can't under stress how complicated this real this this area is and I think you know Matthew said it earlier it's just when you're going to get hacked and how you deal with it and what your procedures are to recover from that as quickly as possible. And one of the things that we find when we're dealing with, with uh, incidents that, that have happened, you know, we're, we're normally called in to deal with uh, incident response and, you know, to try and figure out what happened, when it happened, who it happened to, where's the data, et cetera, is, is the company is always finding it difficult to disclose this information publicly. Uh, and that's a real interesting area you know i see it in different different views from different uh, organizations but i've learned that actually getting it out in the open reasonably quickly in a methodical way is really really important because it can have a really bad effect later on down the line yeah yeah no 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 definitely and and matthew with regards to something that i remember we used to talk about back in the old etihad days which was the types of training that was being given to people and how effective that training was and, um, you know, with no disrespect to training at all, but the emails are now flooded with, you know, you need to train to be able to do this. You need to train for an opportunity. You need to train to get back to work. You need to train to develop all these sort of things. And the training programs are really good as standalone. And um, they make an awful lot of sense. But it doesn't, it doesn't cater for what you forget when you've been on a training course. And if the competency testing isn't sufficient or challenging enough, then, you know, dare I say, it, it's not very effective. Yeah, uh, if I could just clarify, Chris, we're talking in terms of still that, that cyber challenge, right? The, the in, in general, th this in, covers in general, Matthew, but obviously, it, you know, it has a bigger effect as it cascades down onto, onto data and security and cyber activity. Yeah, yeah, of course, there are, there are inherent vulnerabilities uh, associated with training, that, that's for sure. Uh, I think, in you know, if we refer to our our old days together, um, we always spoke about this this sweet spot between you know training competence type training and the, and on the job training, right? And yeah, and we worked in a uh, we had you know 
really strong indigenous workforce that required that that kind of model, that kind of approach. Uh, and yet in, in mature markets such as, uh, you know, Europe and potentially North America, uh, you may not need that kind of on the job mix, right? So, uh, but, but to, to bring that back to sort of the, the digital challenge, um, you know, fishing, for example, yep. uh, not, not the traditional sense, but, um, mm -hmm. you know, that, that's a number one cyber vector and every organization is struggling in how to change um, behaviors in the way that we deal with email information and and look at look at some of that content right and and in my case uh, if if I haven't had that coffee by ten o'clock in the morning I, I'll struggle to find you know some some of the, those those emails that come through right so yeah it's a there's, there's a bit of a road ahead in in um, just being able to evolve the the training models um, more than just the the tick box exercise which um, you know the regulatory instruments lean us towards yeah yeah no exactly now earlier on we were talking about certain issues and and kester one of them was about dry ice limitations that were increased for covid vaccine shipments now as far as any problems related to that kester you know what what would they be well there's there's a lot of scientific material out there that and and you know if you read all that, then you can come up with a lot of uh, different uh, angles to look at it. On at the other side, I, if you have dangerous goods like dry ice and you know what you are doing, it is not dangerous at all. So then mm -hmm. it's more the undeclared stuff that is dangerous and not so much this one. So I think um, we, are, we can carry up to twice of the, the, the present standard amount. We are doing several tests on board of our aircraft to see what it does in terms of uh, CO2 uh, emissions and all that. <laughs> but uh, I think the, it, it can be increased. Um, but everybody, again, is very careful because it, it's like it has this, uh, this label of being very dangerous. And I, I think that uh, if you look at how the packaging, for instance, um, has, has improved uh, over the past two decades, the sublimation rates have gone down uh, hugely. So, um, and the demand side, which is moving the vaccines at certain yeah. temperatures, have clearly shown there's a, a very big business need in transporting these goods around the globe. So we should uh, be more open to change on this one. Again, uh, not uh, look away for risks, but also be realistic in what we can do and what we cannot do. Yeah. So I no. think the risk is limited, uh, and, and as long as we know how much we are carrying and that is within these new limits no problem at all yeah no no exactly and matthew from your perspective on the security side you know with having to top up dry ice and get access to packaging etc you've also got concerns in that area yeah absolutely um kind of kind of raised to us just recently uh, around as you said that the top up people breaking into consignments in transit uh, to to add dry ice to you know these temperature sensitive uh, shipments, uh, and then just kind of you know putting it back and and on on you, on you go right. So, um, the, you know there are compliance challenges with that, but but then of course just the you know we go back to this trust in the way that you you manage security controls physically, the people itself. You know K Kester spoke around. Um, it's all well and good to have all these these controls in place, but if if you don't invest in the people and you know potentially understand basic motivations and welfare of people involved with that, uh, you know you're vulnerable to um, to all forms of of exploitation. So uh, we're we're working with a couple of dedicated forwarders to to understand what what those um, potential vulnerabilities could be, and and you know again just just making sure the compliance piece is not compromised or, or minimized as, as best you can uh, but you know these these um, uh, sophisticated supply chain issues are, are, are you know probably only just the beginning at this stage yeah yeah no so, I imagine so that. if I can add to that Chris because there's a, there's a dilemma here which yeah. is uh, we're talking about data sharing and status of shipments at the same time we are seeing some examples of social engineering where somebody outside the company kind of um, sends an email to any employee 
<clears throat> and it's not very difficult to uh, come up with uh, the email address these days. It's very standardized. So kester.meyer yep. at, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So they will then get an email saying, yeah, hi, I am uh, Mr. Mr. Bob from uh, customs and this and this country. Uh, can you provide me with the location of this shipment? Now that, and I think most people are very supportive and helpful and they want to take care of customers, but even uh, enforcement agencies, they're like, oh, wow, this is serious. So yes, I will provide that information. And here, this is one of the hardest parts is the social engineering, how to make our people aware, how to make ensure that they have the right uh, attitude and behavior towards this type of uh, inquiry. And, and at least how do they know that it's genuine? Um, yep. uh, because yep. we, we see the schemes are getting more and more advanced uh, looking very genuine, but we have had cases of uh, of this social engineering. I know it's terrible. Is that I, I, you just can't believe that? Well, you can, I suppose, for, for every good person, there's somebody who's got different motivations as well. Now, Sonny, something else that um, you know we 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 uh, excuse me, <coughs> we have data loggers in in lots of our shipments. Now, equally equally from a from a hacking perspective, if people can actually get into that and see where shipments are. I mean, that's another big threat. Oh, it's a huge threat. And, and, you know, if it's connected somewhere to the internet, to the network, you know, people can get into it. It's, it, it's, it, it can be broken into. So there's no doubt that any, anything that's got some good data for someone to break into can be, uh, can be attacked. And uh, that reconnaissance of data could be really valuable in figuring out, you know, where a shipment is, where an aircraft is, uh, and that can be used in a really negative way, of course. Yeah. So, so uh, I never underestimate anything that's connected, uh, its ability to be hacked. And, and the sad thing is probably these data loggers are relatively old school technology. You know, they were developed many years ago using you know, an old operating system possibly. And, and those are the cracks and nookies that these hackers are trying to look for to get access to. Uh, it's, oh my God, the, the, the more you let your mind go, I mean, it's terrible, isn't it? And, yeah. and coming, coming back to the data loggers, uh, Kester, obviously for, for them, you know, containing lithium batteries, and then you've got their requirements that were exempted for COVID. You know, there's so many things that have been, been shall we say, that the agility of how to change or how to upgrade. So you were talking about dry ice, now we're talking about lithium batteries. If things can be done under extreme circumstances, you ask yourself again, you know, why weren't they being done earlier? Exactly, and, and what we see now is that uh, they have been exempted, especially in the in the context of the COVID vaccine shipments. So why should we not continue with this one? It has been discussed within IATA, within ICAO for the, the past few years, and all of a sudden, because of this crisis, we are now open to this capability, and I, I think. Um, the, the only problem we have is that the, the final approval still needs to uh, occur. Um, and I, that's where we would need the uh, ICAO or other regulators to, to step up. Um, uh, and, and I agree with Sonia, if, if we can upgrade also the technology to ensure that, that the data is not uh, used or, or abused in, in the wrong way, but it does provide a very positive uh, benefit to what is happening to these uh, vaccine shipments. I recall that one of the pharmaceutical people told me that 50%, 50% of their shipments did not reach the patient from production to patient. Wow. And I think having these loggers will uh, increase uh, at least the, the successful uh, delivery of uh, pharmaceuticals and vaccines to patients. Mm. So yeah, we should innovate, but also allow this, this type of, uh, of uh, data loggers on board yeah no 100 100 percent. and on that point matthew just you know just letting minds wander and 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 almost being a filmmaker mentality if you look at some of the shipments and we were talking earlier and kester mentioned about green channels and amber channels etc i mean there's also a way now of diverting shipments and diverting the classification of shipments within authority systems themselves and if that's not picked up I mean, that could go totally unnoticed for an awful long time and it could have a terrible effect. Yeah, very true. I, I think that comes back to that risk based philosophy where um, if, if you were to apply the traditional 
IKEA terminology of screening, yeah, their cargo would be stopped overnight, right? You, it, it would be worse than what we've gone through with COVID, right? So, uh, it, but it also goes back to just how flexible that screening definition can be, de yeah. depending, as you just said, depending on the limitations of your imagination, right? And 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 of course, recognizing that uh, supply chain. If, especially for those high export locations of the world is is just fundamental you absolutely have to have that have that um have that in place and and have security controls that you can recognize upstream amazon's going through that same challenge walmart in the us right now yeah. and in the early days of the pandemic we did have regulators that were uh you know coming up to speed as quick as they can on um, you know, life sciences and and how how those commodities are to move in aviation uh, across air cargo, and believe it or not, there were discussions around applying X-ray screening to this. Yeah. You know, in in that sort of, you know, to use the again the air cargo terminology in that final mile, they were they were looking at you know, and we were just like, oh, hold on, hold on, you know, that's you you're not understanding just how sophisticated this is, and to Kester's point, just how long we've been doing this for successfully without incident and without notable regulatory change right so um but you know when we get to the the positives part of of this discussion as, as noted in our brief uh there's there's plenty to talk about there also in in the way that this this pandemic has also created just incredible opportunities for for us to to take on challenges that will certainly outlive outlive our, our careers here today yeah yeah no no that, and that and that's and that's important matthew about the positivity that's there as well and i'm assuming with yourself and sunny that you've got experience or you're aware of you know various levels of artificial intelligence and algorithms working out how to counteract or which areas should be looked at where the risks potentially be etc and it keeps building and building and building so i would imagine that's very sophisticated yeah, it is. Uh, and, you know, one of the things that we, we do really well is we're looking at behavior change on, on endpoints and yes. on servers and, and in the cloud. And when there's a behavior change, um, our teams attack and, and investigate and look at it. Um, because with phishing, with the complexity of other angles, it, it's it's the, the way hackers get in is just changing all the time. But when there's an unusual pattern, that's the thing that triggers an alarm bell for our teams. And then we kind of dive in and investigate um, because I think, you know, most organizations have got decent virus protection, next generation firewalls, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but even they are not that good, to be honest. Yeah, no, it's a, it's, it's a big worry. It's a big worry indeed. And, yeah. um, and, and actually, ask... one more point actually, Chris, is one of the things I've found is when a hacker gets in, they want to encrypt everything. They want to encrypt your, your current endpoints, your servers, but also they go for encrypting your backups so that you yeah. cannot actually recover. And, and so many people have got, you know, digital uh, media as their backup. They're, you know, streaming backups to, to live disks or whatever. And those are just easy targets as well. So people really need to start thinking about air gap backups. And, and sometimes, you know, people say, oh, you know, I back up onto disk, but actually having a tape backup is actually not a bad idea as well. Um, some of the complex air gaps, digital backup solutions are very expensive and most people can't afford them. But going back, backwards to a, a kind of a tape system has worked for many customers, to be honest. Yeah. In situations. Yeah, some, some good old days, eh? And, yeah. and with, with that in mind, and I'm obviously not, not to make everybody want to panic and everything, but the, the link to the, to, the, uh, to the COVID situation is nobody actually, nobody actually was even thinking about worst case scenario when the first cases start to happen. They were waiting to see if it happened on their, on, on, on their land, on their shore, and then responding. And now there's, you know, the way, the way the politicians reacted. Did they go scientific? Did they go feeling? Did they go political? That's all changed. So everything, everything has changed. So this now is just, a, it's about awareness and doing something ahead of time that can, you know, that can put yourself in the best possible position. And mm -hmm. the question I'd like to ask you both again on the cybersecurity side, and, and I don't mean to be excluding you there, 
Kester, please jump in as well. But um, when these things happen, what what is the what's the most common, you know, hindsight or you know, what if or I wish I had statement that comes from senior management when they when they really assess what the actual damage or the potential damage could have been? Uh, I've got one, and I'm really hoping uh, Sonny can build on it. There was there was a notable breach earlier this year involving passenger data, and it. It was almost, I mean, Sonny used the word reconnaissance, right? It, it was somebody, it was something found in a system, in a critical system. There are, you know, oodles of customers connected to this particular system. And there wasn't actually anything stolen or, or encrypted. It was simply, uh, from, from what we can determine forensically, it was simply a, uh, a reconnaissance mission, right? It, it was just a surveillance mission. Um, to Sonny's point, uh, most hackers or the, the lower level ones, they'll actually rewrite some of your your code, so their hacking ability can be you know further you know yeah, yeah. demonstrated um, depending on how bad how bad your network is. But the point I was trying to get to is uh, through that breach and just how um, extensive it was, uh, a lot of customers found that either they weren't aware of of just how complex their supply chain is. Yep. Or, or secondly, the contracts they had in place or the SLAs that they had in place uh, did not in, did not allow them to to even be able to determine at a at a high level um, the the nature or scale of a breach on their own customer information. And and again, you know, without without naming names or, or corporates or anything like that. That that was a leadership concern that came out of it. How do how do we not know what what our what data is in our supply chain, and how do we not know whether that's been accessed, breached, or stolen, or or whatever it be, right? And and so in the in the physical world, uh, through you know with the OEMs and and buyer furnished uh, equipment providers and all the different bits, you know, as as a leader, you can imagine. Um, being able to have have access to certain parts of, of that supply chain, right? Just, just as we do in the the MRO world, uh, but the digital opportunity has has changed the way that we do contracts and or or is evolving the way that that contracts and supply um, relationships are constructed. But I'll I'll leave that to Sonny to to um, expand on if needed. Oh, yeah, I mean Matthew, you raise a really good point. Um, the supply chain is really important in the whole thing. Uh, and they themselves could be an angle for a breach into a customer. Um, and we've seen it many times. I mean, the Solar Winds one was a classic example where, I mean, everyone uses Solar Winds to manage their environments and monitor their environments. And if the code there itself is hacked, uh, there's a massive breach for everybody out there. So uh, the question really was, was how does a senior person within an organization handle this and, and what do they need to focus on? Um, the, the first thing is, they need to understand that they will get hacked because people get this view that they've got the best IT teams, they've got the best security yeah. teams and, and, and they're protected and everything's going to be good. And they're being told by their people that it's all good. Actually, it's not. That's, a, that's not reality. The reality is they should have the mindset that there will be a hack in some yeah. format whatsoever and have a plan of action in place for a recovery and PR management and communication with their end users, their customers, the supply chain, the whole, whole work. Once that's in place and, and is practiced, they're in a better place because they know they're going to get hacked. They will get hacked. When they're getting hacked, there's a, there's a, there's a, a playbook already in place that they can action quickly. And I think that's the bit that people, a lot of people miss. Yeah. And, and it's... Yeah. But, you know, when you, and, and, and sorry, Kessler, I need to bring you in here as well, because although it's a different subject matter, when you get involved in lots of safety investigations and root cause analysis, I mean, you go through this as well. And then you have to ask yourselves, why did people not prepare for the worst case scenario? Yes, exactly. Because we are, uh, every year we go through our business continuity plans. And what I see is it's very difficult to get people in operations to write something, to say, yeah. wait a minute. So let's, let's assume 
uh, that at some point in time, your, your one of your core warehouse management systems will not be available for whatever reason. And if it's a cyber attack, it can take a, a long while before it will be up and running. It can extend mm -hmm. over 48 hours and maybe even longer. So uh, most business continuity plans only cover the first 24 hours and then we're all kind of uh, screwed or <laughs> whatever <laughs> word you'd like to use. Um, so I think that is one thing. Uh, have another close look at your business continuity plans. Like, what are we going to do in the meantime? Um, do we go back to a paper process or whatever? Um, and I think one of the other items on this topic is, uh, and I think it's um, it's undervalued, but passwords, people and passwords. With legacy, only internally, we have so many systems that require passwords and people... At one hand, we always say, yeah, they're lazy. They should have a difficult one. At the same time, we throw a multitude of systems at them. And for everyone, they need a password. So it's no wonder they will reuse passwords. And when, let's say, they use it for also in their personal life, and they have a web shop uh, where they have ordered the, the latest uh, gadget or whatsoever, and let's say that that, that password uh, that's hacked and the password becomes available to the professional hackers community. Um, and all of a sudden, it's totally out of your control, but they will have access to somebody uh, within the organization and to your organizational systems. And I think also on the hardware side, do we allow people to bring their own device yeah. uh, and, and, and connect it to our networks? You have no idea what's been happening on that device, how well protected it is, um, whatever spyware or malware is in there. So I think we should spend a lot more time on, on uh, providing people with, uh, well, the proper credentials of having something and knowing something. And only with that one, you can do it. The two-factor authentication, all that stuff um, yeah. is underutilized. And, and uh, again, the weak spot is the human factor here where people become complacent and, and reuse passwords. I think we need to do something about that one. Yeah. I totally agree with you, Kester. I mean, password uh, breaches are so, so easy. And, you know, two-factor authentication, you'd be surprised how underutilized that really is. It is it's shocking um, where yeah. we keep talking about it again and again to customers, but there's always someone that doesn't have 2FA enabled and it's a disaster zone. It's also with... A funny uh, anecdote, and I'll share a bad story here. So I'm giving you an example how we should do this. So uh, if you come with your badge uh, to the gate and we have a community badge, this is my air airline uh, badge, but um, because of the shortage of truck drivers and the security assessment of their credentials, uh, they did not have their own badge. They tried to gain access to our premises using badges of two other colleagues that had passed uh, those uh, those controls but because these guys um, they were still uh, waiting for approval but they were short on drivers they just said, okay take take your colleague's badge and try to get there is, is, is asking for problems and and yeah. i'm very happy with our security people that they stopped them at the gate and said wait a minute that's not you but how how many people gain access because we just give it a, a very quick glance and it's like oh it kind of resembles the person who's uh, driving the truck so yeah again yeah. It, sometimes it's too easy i think i think that's um that's that's one of the four um one of the four issues that are something that everybody in safety and security have to be aware of so you've got familiarity favor flexibility and fear and wherever or whatever culture or organization that that exists in. And I've been in many parts of the world. And, uh, you know, when you see somebody in authority and everybody in security or whatever, they just stand back and say, okay, oh, how are you doing? So well, they don't know who it is who's coming in before them or after them or, or why, they're, why they're having to go into the building. And then you've got favor and, you know, oh, it's all right, don't worry, he's with me, let him come in. And you've got, you know, familiarity is a bad one, flexibility is terrible. And then fear when you're, you're frightened to stop somebody because of their their position or their authority. And um, I mean, Matthew, you, you've come across that, I'm, I'm sure, umpteen times. Yeah, the the whole discussion around the insider threat uh, piece, again, just from a universal regulatory point of view, yeah, it's it's changed in the last two or three years, actually pre predates COVID. 
uh, and an alignment between some of the standards between sort of North North America and and Europe. Uh, but yeah, what Casta just described that that's I think that's human nature. Um, you know, the old check-in days. Uh, you know, you got three hundred people standing in front of the desk, and all the agents are sharing each other's terminals and password, yeah. login and upgrade. You know, there are certain privileges assigned and some can do upgrades, some can't. Uh, and the whole need to want to serve the customer and, and do your job properly with it and getting through some of these, you know, irritating controls. Uh, yeah, it's, it's all part of that that security culture. And um, as, a, uh, as a modestly recognized uh, security professional, I, I don't... Um, I don't think those measures are applied exactly how they're intended every minute of every day, right? And th and that kind of you know leads down the path that well, as long as those measures are applied where the risk is greatest needed, and you've got reliability on your risk assessment, and you don't have false positives within that, then I you know I don't necessarily see a a, a massive problem with that. Yeah, no, no, that's good. And I, I think the most important thing here is, you know, and for anybody listening, it's not to uh, it's not to scaremonger or to you know to blow things out of proportion. There's a huge amount of positive and good controlled activity, but the awareness of what could happen and you know being aware of worst case scenario and planning for it. I mean, that's what safety and security is all about, and and that's why it's so important to have professionals like yourselves in the business. Um, I've got one other point I just want to ask you before I before I ask for these these three high impact issues that you put forward. And that is Kester, you were, you were talking to me earlier about um, having cargo in the cabin and using these seat bags. Okay. And will there be a future development of this? Now, if you just look at it, basically you, you go back to the old combi days. I mean, in principle, you know, if you had a few flights and there were like 40, 50 passengers light, you'd say, right, any suitable cargo for the cargo bags, we can take, you know, we can take four five, six rows out and we'll do it accordingly. Um, yeah. And, and also stick it down the back. So we, you've got none of the other trim problems. But um, do you think there's an opportunity for that moving forward? Well, I think that the past time has uh, demonstrated there's an opportunity for that. Uh, although um, taking seat rows out and, and uh, creating a cargo, uh, part of a partial cargo cabin, uh, you run into a lot of type certificates uh, that you need to obtain. So I think there, that's difficult. But having... Um, Same yeah, but, but having seat bags, for instance, uh, where, you can, uh, where you can quickly uh, uh, use that and protect uh, all the equipment that today is within the seat, uh, like the, the in-flight entertainment stuff. We shouldn't yeah. forget about that. Um, so, yeah, uh, on, on the other hand, we have the positive news that from Europe, we can now uh, start carrying passengers into the US, for instance, and uh, we already started carrying into Canada. So I do believe that the cabin will go back to kind of sort of normal at, at least uh, more passengers in there instead of being fully empty. Um, and from the, from the regulatory side, it is, it's being made very difficult because of the requirement of supplemental type certificates on aircraft level. So I, I think the, if there is, a, there is an opportunity, we have used it, especially under these very difficult sub, uh, circumstances but we do need the regulators to uh, to help out here. And I know uh, they are willing, they are capable, they have shown, they've demonstrated that they're capable of doing it. So I do not hope that we go back to the old days and it will take a couple of years uh, to get no, that. No, no. Yeah. yeah, no, hopefully, hopefully we're on a run. But I think any opportunity, you know, should be oh, left yeah. open and should be left, you know, yeah. to any party who feels that they can make use of it. So, you know, so, so it's part of our procedures, Chris, and we can we can reinstate yeah. it at moment's notice. Yeah, that's it. Exactly. That's the best way. Right, lads. Now, three wise men. Um, what I'd like to ask you is if you had the freedom and if, you know, if it was in a different, a different world and you were able to look back, look down, hindsight, everything else, what would your three high impact actions be that you would put forward um, for the industry to take on board in the next six to nine months? What would the, what would the three be? Who wants to start? Well, I can name, I'll, I'll do one first. I think more awareness, absolute training, uh, making sure everyone's aware of what's going on, making sure that they are trained well and can basically be internally alerted of issues. 
Okay, right, that's one. I'll let you have a little pause now, Sonny, so you can think of the other two. So, okay. Kester, Matthew? Matthew, I'll leave it up to you for, and now go yeah. next. <laughs> uh, one, of, one of my favorite ones, uh, and now that it's come to mind, I'll absolutely need to check my <laughs> I utter official positions, but I'll, you know, this is a personal thing, so I'll, I'll definitely run with it. But uh, from a security perspective, I, I don't want us, uh, in terms of international regulations, to be scared of e-commerce and what that might mean in terms of security controls that you may not necessarily always be aware of. I, I absolutely think we uh, have to put the last 20 years behind us. We were all reminded just last week how quickly 20 years is just yeah. goes, right? And we all remember that like yesterday. Yeah. Uh, but but we have to do what we can to enable e-commerce uh, within air cargo um, to a degree that, that of course is safe and secure, but uh, and and to do that is 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 naturally through through risk assessment. Yeah, and <clears throat> good effective risk assessment, Matthew, because on the e-commerce side, especially now with the amount of undeclared dangerous goods and other issues, it's almost now it's got to a point where there needs to be a, a complete review of regulatory criteria for e-commerce within cargo. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, Kester. Oh. Sorry, oh, go on, Sonny, you got another one. Fire no, away, mate. One of the things I think that would be really fantastic, and Microsoft are now experimenting with this, is <clears throat> passwordless access. Because as Kester mentioned, passwords are an easy place for someone to grab hold of an access system. So passwordless, ac passwordless access to your systems would be fantastic. I think it's coming. You think so? Well, you're going to have to explain that to me because I always thought the more passwords you had, and the more difficult the were, the better it was. And now you're saying password less. Well, the, the, the world in the future would be you, you, you log in with your username. Yeah. And you don't have a password. You have two-factor authentication. Your, okay. your validation process is something else. I so you've got your phone, your phone or, a, or an email message. Well, it, or could be, it could be like, you know, your, your, your uh, eyeballs or something like that. You know, fingerprints. Okay, so bi yeah, biometrics and yeah. something like that, yeah. Okay, good, good. Right, that's putting one into the future. Right, Kista. Okay, so easy, you know, remember that? Yeah, button? I remember that, yeah. mate, I remember okay, that. Okay, okay, so. That was easy. So we're looking for three easy ones. The first one for me is that industry and enforcement agencies speed up the connection of risk signal output. If any agency has an amber light, share it with us, please, up front in the booking phase or at least prior to acceptance. The second one, we have demonstrated that with regulators, we should incorporate the way of working on fast track approvals, this capability like cargo and cabin dry ice. Yeah. We've shown we can do it with regulators and industry. Uh, let's keep doing this uh, as, as a best practice going forward. And the third one is about the human factor. When you look in the cockpit, when something goes wrong, they have predefined drills where they first assess the situation and then take action. I think this is a very strong uh, methodology to go back to our people and say, uh, first, if we make you aware of a situation, what is your required behavior? So it kind of in, in terms of drills, predefined, they know what to do when they see a, a package that has been tampered with, or they see an, an identified individual walking around without proper credentials. So yeah. bring up the drills. So it's about people, it's about approvals and sharing signals. Yeah. And even, even that point on drills, Kester, you know, the amount of places I've been to for audits and visits and, you know, people can't even remember the last time they did an evacuation drill or where the, you know, where, where they have to go to the assembly point and record of who's in and out of the building. Some basics are not being done, which exactly. runs through the whole industry. Matthew, another couple of personal ones, not official ones. Uh, yeah, biometrics. I think that's a, you know, when we... Um, talk about potential positive opportunities, um, you know, understanding the privacy and the cyber concerns. I still think there is there is greater opportunities in balance for the implementation of biometrics in, in the way that we move around facilities, move around the supply chain uh, and, and put that degree of, um, you know, security assurance in place. So, we, uh, we see it on the passenger side, of, of course, um, there are natural 
natural benefits attached to that. And I think in, in the air cargo world, um, you know, biometrics can also, also be leveraged. And then one last final piece, again, just continuing down that, that whole digital uh, sort of um, line of discussion, the, the consignment security declaration, I know it's incredibly low hanging fruit um, versus advanced cargo information systems, which, which you see coming into regulatory fruition in Europe, it's already in place for the UK and, and the US. Uh, but the, the CSD and, and, you know, digitalizing that particular process, uh, at, at least just from a member airline point of view, um, you know, it, it, you spoke about agility before, Chris, you know, putting that into a digital process and the way that uh, freight forwarders and regulated agents can identify a security status on, on consignments, that's just going to reduce the, the time uh, and increase the security insurance of, of the supply yeah. chain. Yeah, no, very good, very good. And that leaves one more for you, Sonny. I think, you know, one more I could add is, is it'd be really nice to have better government support. I think um, companies, when they get hacked, you know, they really struggle on what they do. It'd be nice to get governments involved to help stop these things happening. And, and it's happening in the US now, you know, the former coalition, but, but I think more involvement from them would be really useful. So like a support task force or something? Yeah, I mean, having the ICO is nice, but they don't really help you. They don't yeah. guide, you know, they, 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 they're not really that helpful. Actually having some kind of body which proactively helps fix these things in, in the first place um, would be really useful. Because I, I find so many people, uh, when they have been hacked, you know, they, they find it a real struggle, especially if they're SMEs. They find it a struggle on what to do next and, you know, how to solve these problems and why did it happen to me and and i think there could be some additional support given by governments yeah no good shout good shout yeah and, it, and it's amazing how it affects people isn't it and it, it's almost like you know, what did i do wrong and, and it makes them feel even worse and when you get personal hacking you sort of think you know was i stupid did i do the wrong thing how could it you know it, it's, a, it's a peculiar phenomenon isn't it when you've been hacked absolutely and and people i think mustn't forget they have not been targeted for a hack. You were just part of a, a campaign that you were caught in it, unfortunately. And, and you uh, you shared your password, your password was out there, something allowed you to get access. You clicked on a link, you got uh, some malware on your machine and away you go from there. So you, you, most people aren't specifically targeted, it's very rare. Yeah, yeah, uh, well, that's, that's some comfort, Sonny, at least, at least. Yeah. Lads, listen, it's lovely to have you, especially to have you together and knowing that there are professionals who are engaged, as engaged and competent as yourselves, it's a, it's a wonderful thing to know for the industry moving forward. So thank you all for your time and look forward to seeing you again face to face, hopefully very, very soon. And if not in Rome next year, when we'll be able to look back on your three magic submissions and see if anything has happened as a result of it. Pleasure. Thank you. All right, really enjoyed it. Thanks, Thanks guys. Take Thank care. You, Take care.